Hikhus, I say that the destruction of the taints occurs in dependence on the first Yahana. I say that the destruction of the taints also occurs in dependence on the second Yahana. I say that the destruction of the taints also occurs in dependence on the third Yahana. I say that the destruction of the taints also occurs in dependence on the fourth Yahana. I say that the destruction of the taints also occurs in dependence on the base of the infinity of space. I say that the destruction of the taints also occurs in dependence of the sphere of the infinity of consciousness. I say that the destruction of the taints also occurs in dependence on the sphere of nothingness. I say that the destruction of the taints also occurs in dependence on the base of neither perception nor non-perception. I say that the destruction of the taints also occurs in dependence on the cessation of perception and sensation. When it was said, Pikhus, I say that the destruction of the taints occurs in dependence on the first Yahana for what reason was this said? Here, secluded from sensual pleasures. A Bhikkhu enters and dwells in the first Yahana. He considers whatever phenomena exist there pertaining to form. Sensation, perception, one's character slash behavior, and consciousness as impermanent, suffering, an illness, a boil, a dart, misery, affliction, alien, disintegrating, empty, and non-self. He turns his mind away from those phenomena and directs it to the deathless element thus. This is peaceful, this is sublime, that is, the stilling of all activities, the relinquishing of all acquisitions, the destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. If he is firm in this, he attains the destruction of the taints. But if he does not attain the destruction of the taints because of that lust for the Dhamma, because of that delight in the Dhamma then with the utter destruction of the five lower fetters, he becomes one of spontaneous rebirth, due to attain final Nibbana there without ever returning from that world. Just as an archer or an archer's apprentice undergoes training on a straw man or a heap of clay, and then at a later time becomes a long-distance shooter, a sharpshooter, one who splits a great body, so too, secluded from sensual pleasures. A bhikkhu enters and dwells in the first yahana. He considers whatever phenomena exist there pertaining to form, sensation, perception, one's characteristics slash behavior, and consciousness as impermanent. He becomes one of spontaneous rebirth, due to attain final nibbana there without ever returning from that world. When it was said, Pikhus, I say that the destruction of the taints also occurs in dependence on the first Yahana, it is because of this that this was said. When it was said, Pikhus, I say that the destruction of the taints also occurs in dependence on the second Yahana, the third Yahana, the fourth Yahana. When it was said, Pikhus, I say that the destruction of the taints also occurs in dependence on the fourth Yahana. It is because of this that this was said. When it was said, Pikhus, I say that the destruction of the taints also occurs in dependence on the sphere of the infinity of space, for what reason was this said? Here. With the complete surmounting of perceptions of forms. With the passing away of perceptions of sensory impingement. With non-attention to perceptions of diversity, perceiving space is infinite a Pikhu enters and dwells in the sphere of the infinity of space. He considers whatever phenomena exist there pertaining to sensation, perception, one's character slash behavior and consciousness as impermanent, suffering, an illness, a boil, a dart, misery, affliction, alien, disintegrating, empty, and non-self. He turns his mind away from those phenomena and directs it to the eternal divine deathless element thus. This is peaceful, this is sublime, that is, the stilling of all activities the relinquishing of all acquisitions, the destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. If he is firm in this, he attains the destruction of the taints. But if he does not attain the destruction of the taints because of that lust for the Dhamma, because of that delight in the Dhamma, then, with the utter destruction of the five lower fetters, he becomes one of spontaneous rebirth, due to attain final nibbana there without ever returning from that world. Just as an archer or an archer's apprentice undergoes training on a straw man or a heap of clay. And then at a later time becomes a long-distance shooter, a sharpshooter, one who splits a great body, so too, with the complete surmounting of perceptions of forms. 
a bhikkhu enters and dwells in the base of the infinity of space. He considers whatever phenomena exist there pertaining to sensation, perception, one's character slash behavior, and consciousness as impermanent. But if he does not attain the destruction of the taints, he becomes one of spontaneous rebirth, due to attain final nibbana there without ever returning from that world. When it was said, Pikhus, I say that the destruction of the taints also occurs in dependence on the sphere of the infinity of space, it is because of this that this was said. When it was said, Pikhus, I say that the destruction of the taints also occurs in dependence on the sphere of the infinity of consciousness. The sphere of nothingness for what reason was this said? Here, with the complete surmounting of the sphere of the infinity of consciousness, perceiving there is nothing, a bhikkhu enters and dwells in the sphere of nothingness. He considers whatever phenomena exist there pertaining to sensation, perception, one's character slash behavior, and consciousness as impermanent but if he does not attain the destruction of the taints, he becomes one of spontaneous rebirth, due to attain final nibbana there without ever returning from that world. Just as an archer or an archer's apprentice undergoes training on a straw man or a heap of clay, and then at a later time becomes a long-distance shooter, a sharpshooter, one who splits a great body, so too, with the complete surmounting of the sphere of the infinity of consciousness. A bhikkhu enters and dwells in the sphere of nothingness. He considers whatever phenomena exist there pertaining to sensation, perception, conscious activities, and consciousness as impermanent. But if he does not attain the destruction of the taints, he becomes one of spontaneous rebirth, due to attain final nibbana there without ever returning from that world. When it was said, Pikhus, I say that the destruction of the taints also occurs in dependence on the sphere of nothingness it is because of this that this was said. Thus, Pikhus, there is penetration to final knowledge as far as meditative attainments accompanied by perception reach. But these two bases, the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception and the cessation of perception and sensation I say are to be described by meditative bhikkhus skilled in attainments and skilled in emerging from attainments after they have attained them and emerged from them. Ananda on one occasion the Venerable Ananda was dwelling at Kosumbi in Gozita's park. There the Venerable Ananda addressed the bhikkhus. Friends, bhikkhus. Friend. Those bhikkhus replied. The Venerable Ananda said this. It's astounding and amazing, friends, that the Lord, the Arahant, the perfectly enlightened one, who knows and sees, has discovered the achievement of an opening in the midst of confinement. For the purification of beings, for the overcoming of sorrow and lamentation, for the passing away of pain and dejection, for the achievement of the method, for the realization of Nibbana. The I itself as well as those forms will actually be present, and yet one will not experience that base. The ear itself as well as those sounds will actually be present, and yet one will not experience that base. The nose itself as well as those odors will actually be present, and yet one will not experience that base. The tongue itself as well as those tastes will actually be present, and yet one will not experience that base. The body itself as well as those tactile objects will actually be present, and yet one will not experience that base. When this was said, the Venerable Oday I said this to the Venerable Ananda. Is it, friend Ananda, while one is actually perceptive or while one is non-perceptive that one does not experience that base? It is, friend, while one is actually perceptive that one does not experience that base, not while one is non-perceptive. But, friend, of what is one perceptive when one does not experience that base? Here. Friend. With the complete surmounting of perceptions of forms. With the passing away of perceptions of sensory impingement, with non-attention to perceptions of diversity, perceiving space is infinite a bhikkhu enters. And dwells in the sphere of the infinity of space. When one is thus perceptive one does not experience that base. Again, friend, by completely surmounting the sphere of the infinity of space perceiving consciousness is infinite a bhikkhu enters and dwells in the sphere of the infinity of consciousness. When one is thus perceptive one does not experience that base. Again, friend, by completely surmounting the sphere of the infinity of consciousness, 
perceiving there is nothing a bhikkhu enters and dwells in the sphere of nothingness. When one is thus perceptive one does not experience that base. Once, friend, I was dwelling at Sakata in the deer park at Unjana Grove, then the bhikkhuni Jatilagahaya approached me, paid homage to me, stood to one side, and said. Banti Ananda, the samadhi that does not lean forward and does not bend back, and that is not reined in and checked by forcefully suppressing the defilements. By being liberated, it is steady. By being steady, it is content. By being content, one is not agitated. Banti Ananda, what did the Lord say this samadhi has as its fruit? When she asked me this, I replied. Sister, the samadhi that does not lean forward and does not bend back, and that is not reined in and checked by forcefully suppressing the defilements. By being liberated, it is steady. By being steady, it is content. By being content, one is not agitated. The Lord said this samadhi has final knowledge as its fruit. When one is thus perceptive to, friend, one does not experience that base. <laughs>